Deuteronomy chapter 17. Thou shalt not sacrifice unto the Lord thy God any bullock or sheep wherein is blemish or any evil favoredness. For that is an abomination unto the Lord thy God. If it's scabbed, if it's missing a leg, if it's scarred, if it's got a disease, God will not accept it. If there be found among you within any of thy gates, when they get in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman, that's the Bible says man or woman, that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God, in transgressing his covenant. Now what's the transgression? What is the wickedness? And have gone and served other gods, G-O-D-S, and worshipped them, serving in worship. You're taking care of them. You're doing what they want. You're listening to them. You're giving them your time. Now watch this. Either the sun or the moon or any of the hosts of heaven, the stars. Now you run that sun, moon, and the hosts of heaven right back to that small G-O-D-S. Because it says gods and worship them either, comma, either the sun, the moon, or the hosts of the heaven. That's going back to that G-O-D-S. And the sun and moon and the alignment of the stars, that's your daily horoscope. And God calls that wickedness, he calls it transgression, and he will not allow it. Now, there are looking at the sun and the moon and the stars, if you want to navigate a ship. Or if you're out in the middle of the woods somewhere, out in the middle of the desert, and you want to know your position, okay, you can look at that. If you want to know what time of the day is, okay, go ahead and look at that. There's a sundial. But when you got the object of serving and worshiping, and what's what's the danger of the horoscope? I'm going to leave my whole day by what today says in the wherever you read your horoscope, and that horoscope is based upon the sun, the moon, and the stars. And it be told thee that there are people who are doing the worship of God, the worship of the moon, the worship of the sun, the worship of the stars, gods. And thou hast heard of it. It's been a testimony. And inquired diligently. You've searched it. You checked it out. You made sure. You dotted every I. You crossed every T. Now let's go to chapter 13, verse 14, real quick. Deuteronomy 13, 14. That. Then shall thou inquire and make search, ask diligently, behold, if it be true. It's the same thing. It's the same subject. It's a verily, verily. Somebody's worshiping a God. Okay, you go there. And you look. You examine. You get, you get witnesses. You get evidence. You see. It's almost like a crime. Fingerprints of crime. Uh, get blood samples in a crime. Was there any witnesses in the crime? And behold, it be true. And the thing's certain. You better make sure there be no mistakes on this one. That's such an abomination. The worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Abomination. It's wrought in Israel. Israel. We're talking about the nation of Israel, but still this holds true for Christians. And thou shalt bring forth that man or that woman. There's no distinguishing of the sexes here. Women's rights is just as much as man rights when it comes to this abomination. Which have committed that wicked thing. Run that back to G-O-D-S, sun, moon, and stars. Onto thy gates. I would call the space industry the worship of the sun, moon, and stars. Uh, let's see. Let's see. What was the name of the, the spaceship? Uh, Apollo? 
I think that was the name of it. And they looked to the heavens to find life outside the Bible. They have their own God called evolution. Romans chapter 1, God's against that. Are they Christian be working for the space industry? Any of them? Absolutely not. Their main mission to go into outer space is to find what the Bible says and try to make the Bible a lie. That's their whole mission. To prove God wrong. They're not going to do it, but that's their mission. It be true and the thing certain. And that such abomination is wrought in Israel that thou shalt bring forth that man or that woman which has committed that wicked thing, that, 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 unto thy gates. Even that man or that woman, and thou shalt stone them with stones till they die. Now, the biggest thing they have with, with capital punishment today, it, it's inhumane. They're going to hurt the person. He's going to struggle. He's going to grasp for life. Oh, it's just so intolerant what they do. Can you imagine having people pick up stones and cast them at you? And you do not die right away. It takes a while. Now, I don't know if they stone you until you're absolutely dead like they did Aiken, like they did with Stephen, but that's going to hurt. I've been hit with stones in the head. And that, and that, there's no way to describe when you got banged in the head with a stone. It's like, it's like a rumbling inside you. Along with your pelvis, along with your hips, along with your knee, along with your elbow, along with the side of your cheek, along the side of the back of your head, along the side of your chest, along the side of your back, along the side of your hands and your feet. They're all coming at you. And God said that brutality of that death, you do it. And the people that are doing it, and the people that are watching it, and the people that hear about it, they're going to say, I better not do that, what they did. Because I don't want to die like that. And the thing is, what they object to is capital punishment is a deterrent to crime. At least the person who has been put to capitalized punishment will never commit the crime again. That's 100%. And if you're in your right mind, if you've got a good conscience and you see somebody getting stoned to death for a crime, it ought to make you think, no. And then again, man is stubborn. But all the warnings on these pills, these medications today. Look, at the people know the results of drinking and driving. People know the results of marijuana. People know the hazards. And they still do it. Capital punishment is to get rid of the criminal and to have you look at it and say, I better not do that, but man is so thick-skinned and stiff-necked. At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. You need two or more witnesses. Jesus traveled around with twelve of them. Even Paul, if he was alone, had the witness of another prisoner or a guard that was chained to him. Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. Never get caught like Joseph, especially in the ministry, when he's all by himself and there's no one there to help defend him. And when it comes to a court of law, there, are, there must be the minimum of two, if not more, witnesses. That's the court of law in the Bible. And there was a problem when Jesus tried. They found all these witnesses, and yet they had more than three. They could not agree with each other. That was the problem. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. If only one person witnesses it, you got to be a warning. You better not get caught with anybody else. Now, if that one witness comes and says, listen, I'm only one witness. I can't do nothing. If somebody else comes up and later on says, hey, listen, I saw that. That another person. The hands of the witnesses, two or three or more, 
shall be first upon him to put him to death. Now, that's conscience. We talked about that last night or the other night. I saw him do it. I saw that. Really? Let's take your statements. So, I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. This is what I saw. He gets questioned by both sides. Okay, the person they testified against is found guilty. All right, let's go out. We're going to bring him to the stony yard, or whatever they called it. All right, witnesses, come here. Yes. Here's the rocks. You first. Now, you condemn that man. You witness against that man. Now, you throw the first rocks. As soon as those rocks are thrown by those witnesses, then everybody does it. Now, that right there is supposed to be based upon the conscience that if you are telling a lie, you are not telling the truth. I don't want to be the Because... In the Old Testament, in the law that we are in right now, if they had lied, they had committed false witness. That violates the Ninth Commandment. And if they lied about it and they killed that man with stones, thou shalt not kill. They've broken two commandments. And they would be worthy of death themselves. If not, they go. They would die and go to hell. No any offerings they would bring to the temple. It's a serious business. To, de to death and afterwards and afterward the hands of all the people so that thou shalt put the evil away from among you the evil even if somebody's lying or the evil is they have been found out about the small GODS paragraph if there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment between blood and blood murder the death of an animal. You cause injury to somebody. Between plea and plea. Between stroke and stroke. Being matters of controversy. There's the first time controversy shows up. That shows up. We got two, we got two parties here. And we don't know what, what's going on. The evidence stacks equal for both of them. And it's, many judges probably had that situation. One of them's lying, one of them's telling the truth, but ooh, that's awfully hard. Within thy gates, then shalt thou rise. Now see the gates, that's where the courtroom is. We talked about that the other night. That's where they have the judges. Then thou shalt rise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and that will be Jerusalem. And thou shalt come unto the priests, the Levites. And unto the judge that shall be in those days. So what we're looking at here. The circuit court. The municipal court. The minor court. We have no idea. You bring it to the supreme court in Jerusalem. Now these are of America is based upon the Bible. And when you see the supreme court justice sitting in Washington D.C. Above the seat of the chief. Supreme Court judge. There's a picture of Moses holding the Ten Commandments. When they look up, oh gee, what's going on? You know how people look up and they're looking for an answer or something? They're supposed to be looking to Moses. They're supposed to be looking to the law. They're supposed to be looking to God. This is a Supreme Court. Here's a, we, we got a plea. They came up. We said that this guy's guilty. And that guy's, no, I'm not. Paul did that. Paul says, listen, I'm not guilty at all. And they're like, you want to go to Jerusalem? Absolutely not. I appeal to Caesar. Paul went to a higher court. It is perfectly proper. That if you don't think you've got the justice or the judges have no idea, the Supreme Court is in the Bible. And thou shalt come unto the priests, the Levites. Well, if they are there and you go to them for judgment, and judgment is a realm of the government. Well, there's church and state right there that everybody is against. But this church and state is with God, Jehovah of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God that took these people out of Egypt. It's not a Mary God. It's not a Mormon God. And any other God, 
It's not a small G-O-D-S. It is capital G-O-D. And when you go before this courtroom, you're going to be standing before God. And when you say, so help me God, God on his throne. In this courtroom, not in America. And inquire. And they shall show thee the sentence. You don't see where the word sentence comes from? It comes out of the Bible. Of judgment. And thou shalt do according to the sentence. Which they of that place. Which would be Jerusalem. Which the Lord shall choose. Shall show thee. Alright. You owe them a hundred bucks. Well. You owe them a hundred bucks. Capital punishment. Well, 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 capital punishment. You owe him two goats. Well, you owe him two goats. That's what they said. And the implication here that these priests, these Levites, would pray to God and seek God's answer. And maybe even you using the Urim and, and uh, oh, I can't think of them. What was that? Thurum. They might call out the, whole, the high priest with the, with the Urim and Thurim. Like, okay, Lord, spell it out. We can't tell. And it, it doesn't say. I don't know. But there's one thing. They're to look to God for the answer. They're the priests. They're the Levites. Which the Lord shall choose to show thee. Thou shalt observe to do according to all that they inform thee. So what do you get? You get an informant. There's all the words to use in our judicial system, in our law system, and how they come out of, out of the Bible, and they have no idea. According to the sentence of the law, which they shall teach thee, and according to the judgment which they shall tell thee. So look so look what a judge is supposed to do. Now they're supposed to say, guilty, you pay the fine at the window. But they're to explain to both parties, the guilty, the plaintiff, and the, and the defendant, they're supposed to teach them what the law says of what happened. And according to the judgment which they shall tell thee, thou shalt do. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee to the right hand nor to the left. So if you owe... You owe. No ifs, ands, or buts. And a man that will do presumptuously, he's not going to listen, and will not hearken unto the priest, see the priest that stands to minister, there before the Lord thy God. So here's a priest standing before God as a matter of a judgment. And that priest is to, the assumption, would be turning to God and say, God, I don't know, help me. Or unto the judge, which would be the judges in the gates, the circuit courts. Even that man shall die, and thou shalt put away evil from Israel. Now, isn't that a harsh penalty? You owe him four sheep. I ain't going to give him four sheep. No? No, I'm not. Okay, now you're going to die. They don't realize, people don't realize, the unsaved don't realize, God is serious. And when God says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you believe on Jesus, surely, securely, of knowing, you're going to heaven. And the Bible says, if you believe not on the Son of God, you shall see the wrath of God. Then you're going to get the wrath of God. That's serious. I don't care if you're a little old grandmother with gray hair and you sold and bought all Girl Scout cookies. Without Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. I don't care what you believe. I don't care what you think. I don't care what the guy behind your pulpit says. I don't care what you read in the newspaper. <coughs> <clears throat> if God said it, it stands. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the standard. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There's nothing else. And many people come up, oh, I'm good. I, 
There's none that do it good. What's your problem? And this sentence of the law, whether it be money, whether it be prison, whether it be animals, whatever it be. You know, one of the things the law said, if you were to guard out a guy's eyes, an eye for an eye, two for a tooth. Well, I ain't going to, well, now you just lost your soul. And all the people shall hear. That's not enough, comma, and fear. So you see those judgments. You see those things are to bring fear. The fact is that there may be a cop with a radar around the corner and catching you go over 45 miles per hour. That's the fear that there will be a ticket in your hand. That's the fear. The fear is supposed to be when you crawl through somebody's window. Uninvited. The fear is to be that you broke the law, not that if you get injured that you can go to the court system and sue and take the house on the people that you broke in. It's supposed to be, I am not supposed to be doing that. I am not supposed to be doing that crime. You want to laugh at what goes on in the jail systems in America? There was a woman back in Connecticut. She was a bank robber. She was caught. She was put in jail. She came out of jail. She robbed more banks. And what did they find out? She learned in the jail from the people how to do the job more efficiently that you don't get caught. That's not a correction system. That's a joke. The laws are established by God. Parenthesis. Well, in this chapter, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, they're not there yet, but they're going. Look at the promise. You're going there. And shall possess it. You're going to get it. It's yours. Is that uplifting for these children of Israel? No more 40 years wilderness journey. You're going in. And shall dwell there. And shall say, I will set a king over me. 1 Samuel 8, 5, 19 and 20. We want to be like other nations. Now learn, I will set a king over me. Like as all the nations that are about me. So let's go to First King, First Samuel eight. Let's check something out here. We'll look at two points here. If God doesn't know what you say or what you're going to say, this will show you He does. First Samuel eight, verse five. Now First Samuel is written. I don't know about the dates. Know a lot better than I do. B.C. one. 1120, 1120 B.C. Deuteronomy was written 1451 B.C. Just rough estimate saying 300 years. 300 years between Deuteronomy 17 and 1 Samuel 8. Now, Deuteronomy came first. 1 Samuel is going to come after. Okay? So, let's see verse 5. 1 Samuel 8, 5. And they said unto Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Let's go keep your place there. Let's look at God. The foreknowledge of God. This is important. Verse 14 of Deuteronomy. Like on all the nations that are about me. Go back to 1 Samuel 8. Like all the nations. It just didn't quote God completely. <laughs> he didn't know that. God already knew they were going to say as all the nations. In verse 14 of Deuteronomy 17. And that's what they said. Now notice what it also says in 1 Samuel. And said unto behold thou art old. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to what? What did we just talk about previously? asking for a king. 1 Samuel 8, 5 out of the words of the Jews is Deuteronomy 17, and I bet you they even had no idea. Now, isn't that God foreknowledge? He knew they were going to mention judge first, so we talked about the judges first, and he knew they were going to say like other nations, so verse 14, as the nations. They just didn't quote that are about me. They subtracted from the word of God. Deuteronomy 17. Isn't that interesting? God already knows what you're going to say. 
thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. King Saul wasn't really God's chosen. King David was. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. So when the Jews before Jesus Christ is before Pilate, we have no king but Caesar, they have violated Deuteronomy 17. Caesar is not Jewish. Saul, King David, King Solomon, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, and all the way to, and Jesus Christ are Jewish. They are their brethren. Shall set over they, thou mayest not set a stranger. We want, we rather have Caesar. That was their choice. And they've had Caesar for 2,000 years. And direct violation is 1715. They asked God for Caesar. God said, okay, I'll give you Caesar. Which is not thy brother, Jew. John 1 11 says, Jesus came unto his own. And his own received him not. He came as king of the Jews. But he shall not multiply horses to himself. Solomon blows this one. 1 Kings 10.28 Nor cause the people to return to Egypt. He blows that one. He gets the Egyptian wife. And he goes sends for her. To the end that he should multiply horses. He blows that one. For as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. They all blow it. They all blow it. Neither shall I multiply wives to thyself. He blows that one too. All together a thousand wives. When I read the Bible, that concubine, that's a wife. That's just a wife with another name. And God says it. David left his concubines, and later on he calls them wives. They're wives. So Solomon blows that one, that his heart turned not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. He blows that one too. He blows the, ho the horses, he blows the Egypt, he blows the wives, and he blows the silver and gold. He blows it totally. And you wonder why his life ended up in doom and despair and worshiping every god under the sun. Oh, it says he worshiped Baal. Let's go back to 17 verse 3. G-O-D-S, the sun. He blew that one. He blew that one. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom. That he shall write him a copy of the law in the book out of that which is before the priest and Levite. That's not recorded anywhere in the priests. Anywhere in the kings. Nowhere is that commandment ever found of any king and any priest given to the king. To I don't know if it happened. But it's not recorded. That any king sat down and took the law and wrote it out. But the Bible says he's to take that copy of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and he's to have his own handwritten copy by his throne. Now let me ask you a question. Who is this guy? What is his title? So what do you hold in your hands that was hired by a king to write the Bible? King James. There it is. We don't have a duke. James. We don't have a President James. We have a King James Bible and he hired the elite of the elite of those of his time that was the highest education of his time. He hired them and paid them to produce our Bible. It has been under the authority the authorized King James Bible. It doesn't say the consuls to take the Bible, right? It says the king, there's the King James. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. Queen Elizabeth kept her Bible by her at all times. He shall read it. He shall read therein all the days of his life. Daily reading of the Bible. That he may learn to fear the Lord. Reading the Bible is to cause you to fear God. 
Do it. I'm done. Got my three chapters done today. I read my Psalms today. To get you to reverence God. To keep all the words of this law and these statutes. To do them. So a king would be no excuse. Whether he writ the Bible himself or he didn't write it. Because if he didn't write it, he's ordered to write it by the Bible. And if he does write it, it's going to be kind of hard to sin when you wrote it with your hand. Imagine him writing down the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And if they do, you wrote it down. And it's multiple times through Exodus, through Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Pride. And that he turn not aside from the commandments, from the commandment, Solomon does. To the right hand or to the left. To the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom. Again, that longevity if you keep the law. That's not church age. And his children. Oh, they blow it. Next king after Solomon, Rehoboam. What happened? He splits the entire nation into two. That's still two nations today. In the midst of Israel. 